Near his death, a Saturday Night Live comedian from the 90s named Chris Farley stated these words, There's only one who's in control. He'll take me when he wants me. I don't want to know about it. It's none of my business. I just hope he'll forgive my sins. Well, we can have more than a wishful hope that he'll forgive our sins. We can know that God forgives our sins. We can be confident in the face of death that God looks at at us as perfect forever when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. Because Christ guarantees the fulfillment of our new covenant. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 22 is the statement that is central to this section of the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 7.22, we read, So much the more also, Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. Now, the word covenant means a contract. God establishes a contract with us in Jesus Christ. Christ guarantees the fulfillment of the terms of that contract. The words, of course, are legal terms. The word for guarantee literally referred to a security deposit, if you will, a surety, a security deposit that backed the contract. Somebody guaranteed that contract. When when you pay a security deposit, you are giving assurance that you will fulfill the terms of that contract. So Jesus Christ is God's security deposit that he will fulfill his contract that he makes with us. We will be forgiven for our sins. We will live forever with him. He cannot forfeit his son. His son's the security, the surety. So we can know that we will be saved. Our contract with God is guaranteed then, first of all, in the argument of this section of Hebrews, It is guaranteed by a permanent oath. Now, we've been following this theme in Hebrews chapter 7, and he's continuing on with the theme in verse 20. We'll back up there and pick up with this paragraph. And inasmuch as it was not without an oath, for they indeed became priests without an oath, but he with an oath, through the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, thou art a priest forever. So much the more also then Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. Here's the word cloud for the book of Hebrews. In the word clouds, the the most important words are graphically portrayed as bigger. So you can see certain themes in the book of Hebrews and priest and covenant are major themes, obviously, of the book of Hebrews. The book is all about how humans can be right with God. And that requires a covenant, a contract between God and man. And it requires a priest to take care of the sin problem that separates man from God. Verse 22 is the first time in the book of Hebrews that the word covenant is used. But it will be the major theme of the next few chapters. So he's transitioning from the priesthood, which he's been talking about now in the previous chapters. He's transitioning from that to the topic of the covenant or the contract that God makes with men. Christ is a new priest, he says, unlike the old priests. The Old Testament priests certainly represented the people to God, and they represented God to the people. But these priests were not established by any oath from God himself. God established the priesthood uh, to simply be the descendants of Aaron. The The Levitical priesthood followed through in that pattern. But God established Christ as as the new priest by an oath. He swore an oath that Christ would be a priest forever unlike the Old Testament priests. Now, we swear oaths in a courtroom to affirm that what we say is true and we will do what we say. God 
Does he need to swear an oath? No, he doesn't need to swear an oath to be true and reliable, but he condescends to swear an oath here as a way of reinforcing and assuring us that what he says is true and that what he says he will do, he will do. God will not change his mind, the text says. He's not going to change his mind about about this, this life in Christ, the priesthood of Christ forever. It's a forever priesthood, and God's not going to change his mind. And when you come to him through the priesthood of Jesus Christ, it is a forever life, and God's not going to change his mind. He's not going to say, oops, I'm sorry, I, um, I thought that was a good plan for a while, but I've decided to change it. I'm going to do it differently. No, God doesn't change his mind on this one. God will never change his mind on this one. That means that Jesus Christ is our priest, and he is our priest forever. There is no end to his priesthood, and we can be absolutely secure in the knowledge that Christ is our high priest. He represents us to God forever. God will never go back on his word. He will never change his mind. We don't need to fear that we will lose out in the end. According to ABC News, panic rooms are the new fad among wealthy people, ever since 911, actually. In fact, there's a movie, I guess, out about panic rooms as well. Security companies regularly install what they refer to as safe rooms. They don't call them panic rooms, but safe rooms. Most of the requests come from celebrities who fear being the targets of kidnapping or stalking or home invasions. It's estimated that there there are thousands of these safe rooms just in Bel Air and Hollywood Hills alone, for example. Safe rooms can be as simple as oversized closets with reinforced doors, a phone, and a fridge. They can be, however, very extravagant secret rooms with video banks and computers and air systems that protect against biological warfare and all sorts of other kinds of technological advances. According to Bill Ridgen, an executive with Building Consensus, which is a Los Angeles company that specializes in safe room construction, the requests for elaborate security systems greatly increased after 911. And they've been busy ever since. People live in fear. People are afraid. What's going to happen? But as Christians, we don't need to be afraid. We don't need to live in fear. God swore an oath that Christ will be there for us as our priest, no matter what, forever. That's a long time. We are absolutely secure in him because God can never change his mind on this one. He has a contract with us that will last forever. Our new covenant is guaranteed then, first of all, by a permanent oath. And secondly, our new covenant is guaranteed by a living advocate. Verse 23. And the former priests, on the one hand, existed in greater numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. They all had to die. But he, on the other hand, because he abides forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Hence also he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So this is an everlasting covenant because the guarantor is an everlasting priest. Jesus is a priest who lives forever. So he is a guarantor of a covenant, a contract that lasts forever. There are at least two parties in every contract, right? God makes a contract with us through Jesus Christ. This is the new contract, the new covenant, 
and Christ, we will learn as we move along here in the explanation of this covenant, is the mediator of that new covenant. Now, a mediator is one who mediates between the two parties. So he represents us to God, and he represents us uh, God to us. That's what a mediator does. But he doesn't start there. That's where we think of well, what we think of when we think of Christ and his role to us as mediator. But the author of Hebrews doesn't start there. He starts with something different. He starts with the statement that Jesus is the guarantor of the new covenant. He is the guarantee of this new contract that God makes with us. Now, that is a greater responsibility. Legally, a guarantor assumes the obligations imposed by the contract if the contract fails. That's what a guarantor does in a legal contract. The guarantor promises to fulfill the terms of that contract. So that raises an important theological question that is raised here and answered here, I think, regarding, and in the chapters coming up, regarding our contract with God. For whom does Jesus serve as guarantor? Does he act as guarantor to man for God? Or does he act as guarantor to God for man? Do you understand the question? Does he agree to guarantee what God promises to us? Or does he agree to guarantee what we have to do for God. Which is it? The answer will be the focal point of the next few chapters in Hebrews. And the answer is both. Both. He didn't distinguish, did he? Christ is the guarantor both of God and what he promises to us, and he is the guarantor for us and what we have to fulfill for God. That's the only way he can guarantee the obligations of the new covenant, is if he guarantees both sides. Jesus, you see, assumes God's obligations to us. That makes sense. We understand that. He assumes God's obligations to us in this contract. He he guarantees God's obligations to us. But Jesus also satisfies the terms of the contract for us to God. Jesus satisfies the terms we must fulfill to enjoy God's salvation. And that is the background to this very important verse 25, which, I mean, verse 25 is one of the most beautiful verses in all of Scripture, I think, for the Christian. Let me just read it again. Hence also, therefore, as a result of what I've just said, he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. I love the song, by the way, that Nate and the group sang because it is a beautiful picture, a beautiful statement of the theme of the book of Hebrews, isn't it? Jesus is able to save forever, that is, literally, to the completion of all things, to our completion, all who come to God through him. He stands behind God's word to save us, and he satisfies our responsibility to pay for our sin. So he's able to save us to completion or fully or completely because he can guarantee both sides of the contract by assuming the obligations of both sides of the contract. He fulfills God's side. He fulfills our side. So Jesus signs both sides of the contract. It's his signature that's on both ends of this contract that we make with God, that God makes with us. It's basically, then, a one-sided contract, isn't it? (laughs) It's not our contract with God, and we don't get to negotiate the terms of this contract. You know, God doesn't come to us and say, Look, David, I will save you forever if you do A, B, C, and D. 
And I say to God, well, you know, I like the saving forever part. I want to go to heaven, but I don't like the A, B, C, and D. So I'll negotiate with you, God. Um, Let's forget the A, B, C, and D, and let's do the E, F, G, and H. I'll do E, F, G, and H, and you save me forever. It's not the way this works, is it? God says, here's the contract. And I'm going to sign both sides of this contract. I'm going to fulfill the obligations for you, and I'm going to fulfill the the obligations for God. It's a one-sided contract. It's not open to negotiation. The terms of the contract. Well, what were the terms of the contract? Well, at least one of those terms was that if you sin, you pay for sin with death, right? The wages of sin is death. So, everyone who sins must die. Anybody here not sin? We all sin. We all have to die. Well, Jesus paid those terms for us, did he not? In fact, the author of Hebrews will make a big point of this in Hebrews chapter 9 to argue that because Jesus died to fulfill the terms of this contract, then this contract is like a last will or testament. You know what a last will or testament is, don't you? The testator must die in order for the contract to be carried out. But it's a one-sided contract. When you write out a last will and testament, as I suspect most of you, at least adults, have done, and we certainly have, and you sign on the dotted line, you're saying, I give to these people what I have when I die right? It wasn't negotiated with them. (laughs) It's my last will and testament, but I got to die first before they get it. Well, Hebrews 9 says this covenant is like a last will and testament because Jesus Christ had to die before we get it. Of course, he did die, so now we get it. It's a one-sided contract, and that's the way this contract, this covenant with God works. In Christ, we can do nothing to fulfill the obligations of the contract. Christ does it all for us. All we can do is accept it. And therein lies the rub, right? We cannot fulfill the obligations of this new covenant. All we can do is accept it, but we must accept it. Even in a one-sided contract, it must still be accepted. Even in a last will and testament, it still must be accepted by the beneficiary. Notice that the verse says that Jesus is able to save to completion who? The ones who draw near to God through Christ. It's the only way. The ones who draw near to God through Christ. There's the key. We must come to God through Christ or the contract is invalid. Now, unfortunately, we humans want to come to God any way but Christ often. We want to create a God who fits our view of what God should be. Many people don't like the exclusivity of that message, do they, in this world? They don't want it to be an exclusive kind of thing where I've got to come to God through Christ. Well, you know, if that's the way it is, then that's not the kind of God I want to believe in, you see. I... I don't want to have to be limited to this way. I I don't like the idea of a God who you can only come to him through Jesus Christ. That's not my idea of God. I don't think God would set up a system where there's only one way to him. Wait, you can see where all that argument is going, right? It's, I want a God that I want and not a God who is. Pat Morley in the seasons of a man's life, writes, the turning point in our lives is when we stop seeking the God we want and start seeking the God who is. The only way we can enjoy the security of salvation is if we accept the one-sided contract that God makes with us in Jesus Christ. It's all about drawing near to God through Christ. And when we come to God through Christ, then Jesus Christ guarantees not only God's promises 
to us, but our fulfillment of the terms of the new covenant because he fulfills those terms for us. We don't have to earn it. We don't have to prove it. We just accept it. But we accept it on his terms. There's no other way. And once we accept this contract through Jesus Christ, then he always lives, the text says, to make intercession for us. Isn't that beautiful? That's how he guarantees our salvation. He becomes our living advocate in heaven. He is always standing before the Father in heaven, appealing for you and for me. What a beautiful picture of our security in Jesus Christ. He's always there advocating for us. He signs the contract for us, guaranteeing our salvation, and then he appeals for us all of our lives. We have a beautiful picture, by the way, of that kind of intercession by Jesus from the life of Peter in Luke chapter 22. Now, Jesus said to Peter, and these words are said now, you have to understand when they are said. They are said on the last night before Jesus is crucified. And they are said as the disciples are getting to go, getting ready to go out to the Garden of Gethsemane. What is Peter going to do? He is going to do what? Betray Jesus Christ, right? Three times. He didn't like that idea. But Jesus says these words to him, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. And boy, are you going to be sifted like wheat tonight. You are going to be Torn apart. You are going to have the worst night of your life tonight, Peter. And Satan has demanded permission that you be sifted like wheat. Just right through the fingers. Before the cock crows three times, you're going to deny me three times. Peter, no, no, I'll follow you anywhere, right? No, Peter, you don't understand. Satan's already asked permission to sift you like wheat. You're going to have the worst night of your life. But, (laughs) but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. That's powerful intercession. That's powerful intercession. Peter was going to betray the Lord. You see, this prayer of intercession doesn't mean that Peter won't betray him, that Peter won't fail. It means that Peter won't permanently fail. That's a huge difference. Jesus prays the same way for you and for me. It is his constant appeal before the Father in heaven. And it's not that we will never fail. It's not that we will never sin. (laughs) We all sin. We all fail. Right? It doesn't guarantee that we will never fail or that we will never sin. But he permanently intercedes for us with the Father that we will not fail permanently. That our faith will never fail permanently. That's our security in Christ because he's always doing that. No matter what you're going through, he's always doing that for you in heaven. So we come back to God because Jesus prays for us and his prayers are always heard with the Father. You know, it's not as if God the Father is reluctantly sitting up there in heaven saying, you're not going to pray for that David Christensen guy again, are you? Man, I am so tired of you praying for him. I mean, how many times are you going to come to me for that Christensen care? He's such a jerk. I don't know if I really want to. Now, God is not some reluctant person up in heaven. The son is his son. And the son's already signed on the dotted line for you and for me. Thank God for me. Right? He's already signed there. So when the son goes to represent me before the father, the father isn't reluctantly listening to him. He's gladly listening to him. 
Sure, whatever you say, son. He's yours. You've signed for him. That's how the son prays for you. No matter what you're going through, that's how the son prays for me. And it's precisely then why he can guarantee that our salvation is secure. Thirdly, our new covenant is guaranteed by a sufficient sacrifice. Verse 26. Hence also he is able... Oh, that's 25. I like that verse too much. Verse 26. For it was fitting that we should have such a high priest. It was appropriate that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily like those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, because this he did once for all when he offered up himself. The Old Testament priests, of course, were sinful human beings, just like you and me. They had to continually offer sacrifices on their own behalf before they could represent the people to God. Jesus, by contrast, is perfect. He is holy. He is absolutely innocent. He is absolutely pure. He is divided from sinners. That that doesn't mean that he doesn't associate with sinners. We know he did associate with sinners. It means that he was uncontaminated by any sinners or any sin in this world. Totally and completely no stain on him at all from having walked through this life. There's not one of us that can say that. He is absolutely unstained, absolutely uncontaminated, absolutely unpolluted by any sin. So Jesus didn't need to offer sacrifices to God for himself. He was and is already perfect. Jesus instead offered himself as the perfect sacrifice for our sins. He paid our price. He fulfilled the terms of the contract for us. And Jesus did this once and forever. Once and for all time. His sacrifice was sufficient. It was not only sufficient, but it was efficient, meaning that he never had to offer it again. His sacrifice was sufficient for the sins of the whole world. And all we have to do is accept his sacrifice to be saved. His sacrifice was sufficient for the sins you have committed and the sins you will commit. It's absolutely sufficient for everything. Once and for all time. Don't have to go back to him. uh, He doesn't have to go back and perform the sacrifice. Right? It's finished. Our price was paid in full by Jesus on the cross. And that, of course, will become the major theme of the next few chapters of the book of Hebrews. This will become a discussion of the fulfillment of the obligations of the new covenant in Christ. Our new covenant is guaranteed by his sufficient sacrifice on the cross. And so the cross becomes central to our faith. Greg Zanus is a carpenter from Aurora, Illinois, whose father-in-law taught him the trade. In the process, the two became very close friends. But in 1996, Greg's father-in-law was the victim of a violent crime. And he died. In an attempt to express his deep grief and personal sense of loss, Greg built an eight-foot wooden cross, and he planted it at the scene of the crime. Eight-foot wooden cross. That was only the beginning. Greg began building eight-foot wooden crosses and erecting them at the scenes of fatal crimes or accidents all over. He constructed the crosses, for example, standing in honor of the victims at Columbine High School. What began as a personal response to the loss of his father-in-law became a ministry to help people heal and to remind them that Jesus gives peace and grace. His ministry was called Crosses for Losses. Zanus builds the crosses for families of victims of violent crimes from across the country, and then he personally delivers the crosses in his pickup truck, and he has planted hundreds of eight-foot-high crosses as of a few years ago. 
Why? Why is the cross such a comforting symbol? Have you asked yourself? You know, we have accidents around here, right? Where people die. How often when you drive by do you see what? A cross. Even from people who don't go to church. A cross with some flowers around it. Why? What is it about the cross that is so comforting to people who feel a tragic loss? Well, there are several factors. One, one is that we know that Jesus knows what it is to suffer, right? We know what he, that he knows what it is to feel loss and pain and suffer. The cross symbolizes that. But the cross is also empty, right? And the tomb is empty. So Jesus conquered death and the cross, the empty cross is the symbol of the fact that Jesus conquered death by resurrection. And therefore, it is the symbol of hope and peace and comfort for all of us. I mean, the cross by itself would seem to be a strange symbol of eternal life. Yet we find comfort in that cross because of all the cross represents. And when we feel loss, we come to the one who hung on that cross, died and rose again and lives forever. And we find peace and comfort for our pain. Our new covenant finally is guaranteed by a perfect priest. Verse 28, for the law appoints men as high priests who are weak, sinful, you see. But the word of the oath, which came after the law, appoints a son made perfect forever. Perfect priest, not a flawed priest. Every human priest has flaws, right? In the Old Testament, every human priest in the Old Testament was a flawed person. They sinned. They failed. They had weaknesses. Every human does. But Jesus became the perfect priest who alone can make us perfect before God. Reverend Greg Boyle is in the business of erasing the past for people. He's a Jesuit priest, actually, who is the founder and director of Homeboy Industries in East Los Angeles. Reverend Boyle has put together a team of physicians trained in the laser technology of tattoo removal. The team is part of a program that takes the tattoos of ex-gang members and wipes the slate clean for them. For many, it is a crucial service Gang-related tattoos prevent gang members from getting jobs or advancing in work. For others, the markings critically impinge on their mental health or put them in serious danger on the streets. There is no fee. There's no community service required to receive the tattoo removal that's offered by Homeboy Industries. Strictly a gift. I think that's... A very nice picture of Jesus Christ. Regularly, there is a waiting list of over a thousand names. You see, because a tattoo is basically a pretty permanent marking. In fact, the process of removing it is very painful. They literally burn off the skin. It is a permanent mark. And so the spiritual imagery is often compelling for people who have tattoos. Because the seeming permanence of a gang tattoo fosters the idea that the gang's claim on you is also permanent. Got a hold of you. You can't get away. It's a mark of ownership as much as as it is a mark of identity. So the emotional consequence is that it seems a part of you that can never be erased. I think 
Many feel like that with respect to past sins, whose mark it seems like we can never get rid of. The stain is always there. That mark is always there. The mark of the former life, the mark of sin. What is that mark? It's the mark of Satan who's got a grip on someone. It's the mark of sin. And it's powerful. And it feels like to many like you can never get rid of that. Well, no human priest, folks, will ever get rid of that. You can remove a tattoo. You can't change the heart. No human priest will ever do that. But Christ as high priest will do a lot more than remove the tattoo. He removes the stain. He removes the mark that is indelibly written on your heart. He removes the sense that you are in the grip of the enemy. Those marks contaminate our lives. That sin contaminates our lives. No human priest can, do, can eliminate. I cannot do that for you. No human can. I am not a priest. We have now only one priest, and that is Jesus Christ. He is the only priest, and he is the perfect priest. He is the one who erases that past, and he guarantees an everlasting contract for us. He replaced all priests. We can be secure in that contract because we have a priest that makes us perfect before God. Isn't that beautiful? It's an everlasting covenant. Never ends. Queen Victoria once attended a service in St. Paul's Cathedral. She listened to a sermon that grabbed her interest a great deal. And afterwards, she asked her chaplain this question. Can one be absolutely sure in this life of eternal safety? Can anyone be absolutely sure in this life of eternal safety. The chaplain's answer to Queen Victoria was that he knew no way that anyone could be absolutely certain. The incident was published in the court news and came to the notice of a minister named John Townsend. After reading of Queen Victoria's question and the answer that she received from the court chaplain, he prayed and then he sent the following note to the queen. To Her Gracious Majesty, our beloved Queen Victoria, from one of her most humble subjects, with trembling hands but with heart-filled love, and because I know that we can be absolutely sure now for our eternal life in the home that Jesus went to prepare, may I ask Your Most Gracious Majesty to read the following passages of Scripture. John 3.16, Romans 10.9 and 10. I sign myself... Your servant, for Jesus' sake, John Townsend. He was not alone in praying about his letter to the queen. He took others into his confidence, and they gathered, and they they prayed for Queen Victoria. About two weeks later, John Townsend received the following letter. To John Townsend. I have carefully and prayerfully read the portions of Scripture referred to. I believe in the finished work of Christ for me and trust by God's grace to meet you in that home of which he said, I go to prepare a place for you. Signed, Victoria Gulf. (laughs) After Queen Victoria's discovery of Christian assurance, she used to carry a small booklet to give away. The booklet she carried and would give away to people. The title was, Safety, certainty, and enjoyment. Safety, certainty, and enjoyment. Do you experience that? That's what we find in Christ. That's what she found in Christ. And it's what we have in Christ. Let's pray. Father, I ask you to give each one here this morning that sense of security in you. If, Father, they have come to you through Jesus Christ, if not, then draw them to yourself by accepting Jesus Christ and what he has done. 
But, Father, we need that sense of security, that sense of certainty, that sense of cleansing from the past and security for the future that we find in our great high priest and we come to you through him and enjoy life with you by his grace. Amen.